Well, I'm available to start at right tackle. You can't see when I pull this on. Right. Well, there's not an even playing field. There's never been an even playing field. There never will be an even playing field. But... What shampoo do you use on your hair? You don't need to be Superman to play in this offense. You're listening to The Red Zone. Welcome, Badgers fans, to another episode of The Red Zone. I'm your host, Jason Galloway, with the Wisconsin State Journal. If you missed our first episode of the podcast earlier this week on Wednesday, we talked to Benjamin Wargle from BadgersInsider.com. Uh, really just about the, the, the... We went over the passing game, kind of what, what's been wrong with the passing game, why it hasn't kind of come back to life at, the, at any point this season. And, uh, you know, we talked about Jack Cohn and Alex Hornibrook. Is there a whole lot of difference between the two? Um, if, if Cohn has to play this week and, and for the rest of the season. And we just talked about the, the bowl possibilities as well and, and sort of the scenarios Wisconsin might have to take to, to get back in the in the Big Ten West race. But go ahead and check that out if you haven't already. As you guys, I'm sure you guys know, this is our mailbag edition of the podcast, and I already asked for your questions. So I'm going to go and get right into them here. The first one is from Ben Tannenbaum at MadDog74. He asks, both Penn State and the Badgers are in disappointing seasons immediately after New York Six Bowl wins. How do you compare respective state of the programs ahead of this matchup? Yeah, I think it's. I think in both situations, it's 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 you know just two teams that haven't lived up to expectations, but I think are going to be fine moving forward. You know, I think James Franklin and Paul Christ have both done a really good job since they since they took over their respective programs. You know, they've been you know past couple of years they they sort of were battling for for Big Ten Coach of the Year honors. Um, obviously, but I think both programs finished in the top ten each of the last two seasons. I could be I could be wrong on Penn State there. They were, they were at least close the last two seasons, and I think that going into this year, you know, I think Wisconsin's had a more disappointing season than Penn State. Uh, to be honest, I think if you look at Penn State's situation, um, you know, they. Their losses are to you know the best teams in the East, right? I mean, they lost to um, to Michigan, even though it was a it was a real blowout. Uh, they they nearly beat Ohio State and lost to them. And I think their I believe their last loss, uh, their third loss is Michigan State. Uh, so of course that's disappointing. They they expected to be in that East race and and to compete with those teams. But I think from Wisconsin's perspective, it's a little bit it's a little bit more disappointing. I mean, they, they were ranked higher than Penn State, first of all, to start the season. They were they were number four uh, to start the season, so I, I guess you could call it call them somewhat of a favorite to, to make the playoffs. And they, they go out and lose to a, a, a pretty bad BYU team at home. Uh, you know, the Northwestern game is, you know, Northwestern is, is you know, they're, they're playing well this year at this point, but I think from an overall perspective, it, I mean, that could be a 7-5 and five Big Ten West champion uh, when it's all said and done. Um, and then, of course, they, they got blown out of Michigan, too, sort of like Penn State did. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's – I think both programs will be fine uh, moving forward. I think I think Franklin and Chris have done a good job, and um, I, I think they both have, you know, uh, recruiting classes that, that I think will can come in and help them as well. So, um I think the state of their programs are fine. I think I think of course it's disappointing for each uh, that they thought they were going to be real, you know, top ten teams this year and competing for a playoff spot and at least to get to the Big Ten championship game. And that's not really happening for either program. But I think that uh, I think they'll both be fine moving forward. All right, the next one is from Ryder Cup Captain at Badger OC One. He said, based on your film analysis, is the lack of a vertical passing game due more to play calling, receivers not creating separation? or quarterbacks unwilling to take shots. With our O-line, we should have more than enough time to, for plays to develop. Yeah, no, I, I think it's really the, inc- the inconsistent quarterback play is probably what I'd point to first. You know, I think that, um, I just think that, that Alex Hornibrook and Jack Cohn um, just haven't been as consistent as you'd like. Um, you know, they've, uh, they've had their moments, especially, you know, Hornibrook played really well in the second half of that Iowa game, and we saw... Um, you know the the touchdown pass to AJ Taylor in that game to to sort of go ahead there in the final minute was uh, was a great throw and he made some other really key plays on that drive and uh, but there's just been a lot of times this season before he got injured that um, he, he just he just wasn't good enough either and I think from Co- Jack Cohn's perspective the last couple of games you know he's he's been okay but you know he's uh, um, you know they I think they've been really careful about how much they put on his shoulders he's talked about the fact that he's kind of check down a lot uh, maybe maybe sooner than he needs to and I, I think the I think the inconsistent quarterback play also kind of affects your play calling too I mean if you don't have quite as much faith that um, 
uh, in what the quarterback's doing, then maybe you don't take as many shots down the field. And I, I think we saw in that Northwestern game too that um, when, when Jack Cohn's first start, that they're just I, I think Northwestern really sold out against the run in that game. They there was a lot of times where you know, that, w- that was the worst rushing performance for Wisconsin this year, but I think a lot of it was just the fact that Northwestern was was really selling out against the run in a lot of situations, and there were some times where. Uh, they just had the numbers up front, and they had one more one more guy than Wisconsin had to block, and um, they really needed to to kind of open up that passing game a little bit more and, and hit some hit some passes down the field to kind of keep the defense honest, and that just hasn't been happening. Now, from from the wide receiver perspective, I, I do think that they probably aren't creating enough separation either. Um, I mean, the, the, I think some of the blame definitely should fall on them. Now, the difficult part about that is that. Um, you know, with I don't really have access to to coaches tape from you know from behind the play, and so you're you're watching you know you, I'm watching this TV copy, and you can't really see the, you know the receiver routes all the way through, and so it's hard to go back and evaluate them after the fact, and um, so that that that's kind of a that's kind of difficult sometimes to kind of judge these receivers on film, but um, I, I think they definitely have some have some blame to go around. There's a lot of blame to go around for what's happened with the offense and. They definitely have the talent to, um, to have played better than they had this season. But um, you know, I, I guess that's how I would I would break it down. All right, next one's from Brian Kale at Kale underscore Brian. He asks, "How many more scholarship offers do we have out there, and how many more do you think we can land for this 2019 class? Is there any chance we get J.T. Bertrand or Kyle Ford?" Um, as far as how many scholarships they have out, I'm not really sure about that. Now, looking at sort of the numbers on the roster, they don't have a whole lot of open scholarship spots left for this class, and they have 17 in the class right now. Um, I, I think if you, I think they only have 16 or 17 seniors on the roster. Now, um, you have to expect that there's going to be um, some attrition there. I mean, I think, you know, of course, some players are going to leave in the offseason, so you have uh, some spots left to fill. I mean, I'm sure they can bring in uh, at least a few more guys here. Um, as far as who they're going to get, that's, that's hard for me to say, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not inside these kids' heads. Um, you know, I, I don't talk to them often enough to, to really know exactly what they're thinking. So, um, as far as whether they can get Bertrand or Ford, you know, I, 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 that's, that's difficult to predict right now. I can't really say whether, whether they have a great shot at, at those guys or not, but, but I do think that, you know, this is, uh, I do think it's it's good that they have a lot of guys locked up, and now they can kind of go for uh, maybe their higher targets. You know, they can kind of focus some more attention on uh, on trying to lock up maybe some of their uh, some of the guys at the top of their list since they don't have as many spots left to fill. All right, the next one's from Chris Hole at MN Badger Dad. He says, "Why do we rarely, if ever, see UW flipping Power Five recruits? When they do flip someone, it's from a group of five who jumps." at a UW offer are the coaches too nice do they not have the killer instinct that other recruiters have I don't think it has to do with not having that killer instinct I mean there are some guys that have flipped to Wisconsin I mean Jonathan Taylor was a Rutgers uh commit um I think they've uh they've got a couple other off the top of my head I can't think of um a ton right now I mean they don't do it that often uh but I I, you know Wisconsin's not going to be able to flip guys from you know, Michigan, Ohio State, or anybody like that. Um, you know, I, I think that they have to go to, if they're going to flip guys from Power Five, it's going to have to be from sort of the the lower level Power Five teams like Rutgers or or places like that. And um, you know, they flipped a they flipped a Kansas uh, commit this in in this class too, just a couple months ago. They flipped the tight end from Kansas. So th- those are the type of places, and it doesn't get as much attention because you're flipping them from from places like Rutgers and Kansas. But those are power five programs that they're getting guys from and i think that's just yeah i think if you're wisconsin you you can't really expect to convince a whole lot of guys that are already going to uh to to other top programs to come um you know to to come there so i think that they do their best to to flip who they can if if they want them and you know a lot of times you go to you know maybe it may be a guy that's committed to to one of those lower lower level teams and maybe wisconsin doesn't really you know, doesn't have a whole lot of interest in a lot of those guys, but you know, I think they, I think Wisconsin too also gets on guys pretty early. I mean, you see a lot of times where um, Wisconsin's uh, the first Power Five offer on on a lot of guys that that end up getting a lot of offers down the road, and I think they're pretty good about finding some, you know, finding some guys early and, and getting on them and, and 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 offering them early, which I guess that kind of plays into that too. Uh, you know, if uh, um, if a lot of guys have. Um, 
you know, if they're the first one offering, then of course they're sometimes they get an early commitment and, and those guys, they don't have to flip those guys later. Um, so I guess that's, you know, look, they're, they're not, obviously they're not going to flip guys like Ohio state and Michigan and Alabama do. It's just not, they're just not quite on the level where they can, they, they can do that. But I do think they, they, I mean, they, they do go after some guys that are already committed. It's not as if they are, you know, are soft on the recruiting trail or, or don't have the killer instinct that, that you need to try to try to flip a guy that's already committed. All right. Uh, one more from Ryder cup captain here at Badger OC one says serious question. Given Paul Chris priority to run the ball at all costs and less forced to pass. Why would any four star or above wide receiver want to come to Wisconsin? Any, and why the desire to re- recruit under six foot receivers, uh, perhaps because of the first question. Um, you know, I think that there's obviously when, when you have a, a run first offense, sure, that's probably a downside for receivers um, when they're looking at Wisconsin that maybe you won't get quite as many opportunities in the passing game. Um, now, I also think there's a lot more to recruiting uh, than that, though. I think there's there always, there's always so many factors for why a kid might want to come to a place. I mean, they might, um, you know, they might just really love the coaching staff. They might really love the players, you know, current players on the team, other guys in the class when they come on a visit. They might love the campus. They a lot of guys come here uh, that that view it as a good ac- academic opportunity too. Um, you know, I think that's something Wisconsin has over a lot of schools too. There's just a lot of different um, things that factor into it. Now, this is obviously, I think, the style of offense Wisconsin has surely uh, for some guys will be a uh, you know a, a negative in the negative column. I mean, there's you know, I, I'm sure if you're a wide receiver, maybe. maybe some of those guys will value, you know, going to a, a spread offense or a, a pass first offense more. Uh, but there's just a lot of different, you know, scenarios for why guys go where they are. I mean, they, they've recruited a lot of good receivers um, in the past. I mean, Danny Davis uh, was a was a great get on signing day for them. Um, you know, I think he was. Uh, I can't remember if he had a four star rating by. I think he may have a four star rating by by one of the recruiting services. Um, you know, AJ Taylor was was pretty. He might have just been a three star, but he was. Uh, a, I think he was a pretty high three star, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so I, they, they've had they've gotten some talent at receiver. Now it hasn't really come together, um, you know, this year, so to speak. But um, you know, I, I also think that um, as, as far as the under six foot guys, I don't think they're they're looking for short receivers. I mean, I and it's not like every receiver they have is is, is short. But uh, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe you could, you know go after some taller guys, but I don't think they necessarily, I don't necessarily view that as a problem uh, with their receiving core. I mean, um, you also have some tight, they also use their tight ends in the passing game a lot. Those guys can create uh, mismatch problems uh, as well. So um, yeah, so I mean, obviously it's, you know, I mean, in the same vein that, that some wide receivers may, may be turned off by that. Um, obviously they, they don't have trouble getting running backs and offensive linemen interested in this program either because, because they do run the ball a lot. So um, so I guess it goes both ways. All right. Uh, the next question from SMG at Sean Geary four asks, we lose Connolly Edwards and Van Ginkle next season. Who do you think starts in their place and how will the rotation look at both the outside in- linebacker spot and the inside? Yeah. So I think the, I think you're starting linebackers next year. Uh, I, I think on the inside you're, I mean, Chris Orr is definitely going to start. I think Jack Sanborn looks like he's your second guy. He's a true freshman that looked like he was probably going to redshirt, didn't play the first few games, uh, but since then he's been playing. He's he's over the four game threshold now, so he's not even redshirting. Uh, he he's, he looks like clearly the fourth outside linebacker there, um, behind Connolly Edwards and Orr, and so it looks like he's probably got he's probably got the inside track to start alongside Orr next year, um, and then an outside linebacker Zach Bond is returning, so I'd expect him to start again, and then Tyler Johnson, uh, who's the number three this year, I I would think he he steps in and and starts next year next year now he hasn't he hasn't been a whole you know that productive this season and I, I i i was a big fan coming into the year and um you know he hasn't had a whole lot of opportunity either but i think those are your two starters now as far as rotations um you know at outside linebacker christian bell will definitely be you know uh you know rotated in now he's a guy that's that's gotten some some playing time this year and and kind of had his role um increase a little bit since the start of the season so i think he's going to be in there and really the the fourth outside linebacker may be maybe kind of up there up in the air a little bit now Noah Burks has gotten some time this year it looks like he's probably the most likely uh but you know maybe some maybe one of the freshmen who who hasn't played who haven't played this season maybe they step up maybe a a Jalen Franklin has a good offseason or or uh 
uh, you know, uh, somebody like that, you know, somebody that we haven't really seen yet that kind of, that kind of comes out of nowhere this off season every once in a while that that'll happen. You know, um, you Mason platter, a guy that's been out injured all season. Maybe he's, uh, maybe he's a guy that has, you know, a good off season and, and can come in and surprise people. So, um, that's kind of, ha- and, and then an inside linebacker. Um, I think after those starters of Orr and Sanborn, you're probably looking at Griffin Grady and Mike Mascalunas might be your next guys there that two guys that have been on the depth chart here and there at the inside linebacker and, and have fallen behind Sanborn, but I still think could, uh, you know, could be, could be good players for this, for this program. So, uh, I still think they're going to find guys that can play at those positions. Now I, I look, there, there, there's going to be a drop off at inside linebacker. There just has to be, I mean, those, those guys are Connolly and Edwards are, um, I, I think the two best players on this defense and they've been playing really well. And I don't think there's any way they can, um, completely replace those guys but um you know i I, th- I think or and sambor might be able to do a good job for you and uh, you just hope that they can find guys that can rush the passer at outside linebacker i think that's that's really the big question mark that they haven't really been able to answer this year but we'll have to see how it plays out see uh if some of those young guys can have good off seasons and, and come through for them all right next one from we have a couple from zach the great at one sween he asks uh i love the prospects from the last two recruiting class cycles, but I don't see a ton of pass rush specialists. Who would you look to be in the Van Ginkle Watt mode? I guess that's what I just talked. Yeah, that's what I just mentioned. Um, is just they, they have to find uh, pass rushers, and I, it's hard to see where those guys are going to come from. Now, you know, I guess I guess Tyler Johnson is, is a guy that looked pretty good last year when he got a couple starts, but but really hasn't put it together this year. And you know, maybe, maybe there's guys we just haven't seen yet. Like I said, that that can come in and and have a good offseason and play that role. Maybe a guy like Jalen Franklin, who's, you know, he came in here where, you know, he could, probably could have played a couple of different positions and um, maybe it's taken a while to, to, to kind of learn that outside linebacker spot. But, but you know, he, he's a guy that looks pretty physically gifted. And again, we haven't seen a whole lot of him. And really the guys from the last two recruiting cycles, it's, um, you know, you, you, you see him a little bit in, in fall camp and maybe a little in the spring and, uh, they're not getting a whole lot of reps yet, and so it's it's hard to make a full evaluation on them yet. But um, but but I think may, maybe a guy like that, I, th- I think they're going to have to hope that somebody that hasn't contributed a whole lot yet can step up and 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 uh, and really take on that role. Now, maybe maybe Zach Bond can work on his pass rushing as well. I, I think he's you know Bond's played pretty well the last couple games, and and he started to play a lot better than he did earlier in the year. So. So maybe with another good off season, you know, he, he missed all of, of last season with a foot injury. Maybe, um, maybe with another off season, uh, where he can, he can stay healthy possibly. Maybe he can kind of improve in that area as well. And then Zach's second question was, uh, would it really be a terrible thing if Cone played the rest of the year and burned the red shirt? See what we have. And then Mertz starts in two years anyway. Right? So the, the, a lot of people have said this, um, you know, that, you know, why, why does it matter if Jack Cone? Uh, you know, burns the red shirt. You know, uh, Graham Mertz can just take over. I, I, I think we need to be really careful about. Um, I, I know everybody's really excited about Graham Mertz, and and I think rightfully so. I mean, the guy is um, one of the best. You know, quarterback recruits Wisconsin has had. Uh, but we cannot assume he is just going to come in here and and be awesome, especially right away. You know, they, they've had other uh, good quarterback recruits in the past. You know, I, mean, I mentioned this before in another podcast, I think, but Bart Houston was was really highly rated and I, I really like Bard and he did, he did well his senior year, I feel like, but he wasn't, he wasn't ready his second year on campus to play. And we just can't assume that Mertz is going to come in here and um, be able to just uh, as a freshman or even a retro freshman, uh, be ready to just take over and, and, and be the savior right away. I mean, maybe that happens. Maybe he's talented enough to do that, but I think especially the first year, it's going to take him a while to, uh, to get, get the playbook down and get comfortable with the next level um, so I, I think you want to have the option for Cohen to have an extra year. I, I like I said, you can't really assume uh, that Merce is going to be what he's what he's you know what everyone thinks he's going to be. And so I think you want to, if you, if you can at all, uh, if you have that option, you want Cohen to have an extra year in case Merce either takes a while before he is ready or or just doesn't pan out like we hope. So um, I, I I just don't think you can look at. I think you really get into trouble trying to look ahead to the future to a guy that's not even on campus yet that's still in high school and say uh we don't need to worry about giving getting this guy an extra year that's you know the backup quarterback right now because you know we this guy you know this freshman or this high schooler is just going to come in and, and start in a couple years so 
Um, that that that's kind of my view on that. I think they should, if they can at all, um, try to redshirt Cone. And you know, I mean, it, it's just going to depend on Hornibrook's health. You know, obviously, if um, if, if he's back, I think he's going to be playing because they do they do want to keep Cone an extra year if they can. Um, so th- that's kind of my take on that. I mean, I, I know it's. I, look, I understand the excitement for Graham Mertz and and everything, but I just think that we should we should maybe not maybe not put as much pressure as as he's going to have on him, and and I think that don't maybe just don't assume he's going to come in here as as a freshman or in his first couple of years and and be you know way better than than what the Badgers have right now right away. All right, the last one here from Rock Wiss seven one one at Palace underscore Rock asks just how just how good are these new rash of recruits seriously that's a good question i mean I, again i don't really get into the um watching a, a bunch of highlight films on recruits i feel like that can sometimes it can be misleading i don't know you know what what competition these guys are facing exactly um it, it's kind of hard to to know exactly how good these guys are going to be and of course some t- a lot of times people are wrong about how good these guys are going to be so um I, I think it's I think it's tough to predict, and I, I don't I try not to until they're on campus and I actually see them in a college setting against uh, you know in practice against other college players. Uh, but you know to get four commitments in in a matter of four days, which is what they did this past week, um, I I think it's a good sign. I mean, like I like I mentioned earlier, they can maybe with a little bit more in the bag, they can they can go after some they go a little bit harder after their after their top guys now, um, and you know. Um, I, I think there's a wide range here. I mean, they had they got a you know they got a defensive tackle who is a four star recruit, and they also got a you know an outside linebacker in Skyler Myers who um, I, I think just got offered and and is maybe a you know I think one of the recruiting sites has doesn't have him ranked um, or maybe one of them has him a two star. So again, you don't know how these guys are going to turn out. Um, I, I I think that you know we just have to kind of wait and see. I'm not going to try to sit here and you know evaluate a guy that just committed on his high school tape and, and try to decide exactly how good he's going to be. So, um, again, it, it, just from a rankings perspective, it looks like the class is shaping up really well. Uh, but I, I'm excited to kind of see some of these guys once they, once they get onto campus here. All right, that's going to do it for this week. I appreciate all your questions. And if you didn't get one in, we are, or you were late on it, I'm going to do a live chat after the Penn state game, uh, sometime Saturday night. So follow me on Twitter at Jason underscore Galloway to get an update on when I'm going to go live there. And of course, keep visiting madison.com for all of your Badgers football coverage. Thanks for listening.